I don't know how else to tell you folks. That is not a sports car. That's a 50 mile to the gallon commuter car. Then why, sir, does it have four wheel disc brakes? It's a good question. It's because, uh, oh, it's because we started with the trans and the engine from an economy car, and then we moved it to the back and we took the brakes with it. That's why. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then why is the engine a 2.5 liter instead of the far more efficient 1.8 liter it was supposed to be? <laughs> that one's got a big V6 in it. So you're saying it's not? No, no, but it's, but it's still an economy car that also happens to be a sports car. Nice try. You're not fooling me. That's a sports car and you're a liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire. No, no, that's where you're wrong. My pants are just fine. It's the car that's on fire. It's just what they do. That one's gonna burn to the ground. First things first, we need to transport ourselves back to the early 1970s stock market crash, energy crisis, and gasoline rationing. This was a dismal time. Energy was so sparse that President Nixon banned Christmas lights. That's pretty sad, but if you want to cry your eyes out, read car magazines from that malaise era. Every year, year after year, things kept getting worse. Horsepower numbers dropped by half. Cars sputtered, stalled, and drove like utter garbage. If that sounds awful, it's because it was. And so any light of hope was something anyone in the automotive industry would cling to. Pontiac fared worse than most. Its youthful, muscular 1960s image slowly dissipated throughout the 70s as the division was told time and again it couldn't build a sports car. It's not that it would have necessarily threatened the Corvette, but the Corvette was already having financial problems of its own. And the sports car market was so small that it really couldn't support two of them. In 1981, Pontiac got a new boss, and he took a look at Pontiac's offerings and thought, well, hold on, not only is this stuff boring, but it's never going to reach cafe requirements. That's corporate annual fuel economy. So he asked his engineers to think outside the box and come up with a solution for both problems. And their solution was called the commuter car. Car is how car is pronounced in Detroit. It's a car and it's got stab bars and an automatic trans. It's just Detroit. It would be a small two-seater that got a 50 mile per gallon EPA highway rating. Selling just 150,000 a year would earn Pontiac more cafe credits than building 400,000 units of its new four-speed automatic. Plus, it might help Pontiac look cool. The commuter car would be a two-seat body on the new J-Car platform, which was about to debut as a bunch of front-wheel drive penalty boxes. But there was a problem. The transverse engine, the suspension design, and the high cowl would have meant a blunt front end that would have never been able to reach the aerodynamic targets needed to achieve 50 miles per gallon. Plus, it would have been ugly. So a brilliant Turkish engineer named Hulki Aldekacchi solved that problem. He took the subframe powertrain and suspension from the front of the GM X car platform and slid it to the back. The smaller J-Car's 1.8 liter would be thrown in for max efficiency, and the front suspension would be taken wholesale from the rear drive GM T-Car. Done like this, the whole thing would cost next to nothing to engineer. The budget would be just $300 million, less than a third of a traditional new car program. Sounds like a winning formula, a two-seat 50 MPG commuter to hypermile your way to work in. And then something terrible happened. The team made the car look incredible. The P-Car's mid-engine layout was a first for any American manufacturer, and pushing the engine to the back meant it could have wedgy sports car proportions. Taking the front subframe and powertrain from the bigger X-Car meant the small and low P-Car would be wide. And it would have disc brakes at the rear, which is something only seen in sports cars of the era. But nah, this is just a miserly commuter car. It just happens to look like a Ferrari. Just imagine what Aldicacci's running prototype must have looked like to the GM executives in dreary 1980, after almost a decade of darkness. 
It was a gleaming 50 mile per gallon red ray of hope for the future. And so GM killed it three times because General Motors was a financial disaster. But the team never stopped work on the P car because from the very beginning, they'd moved the whole project outside of General Motors. All the engineering work was being done by a small company called Entech, away from the meddling hands of GM's corporate nitpickers. And the best part was that it wasn't just cheap to engineer. The commuter car would be cheap to produce too, because it would be plastic. Altikonchti developed an all new method of construction never seen before outside of racing. The P car used a steel space frame that provided all of the structure. As such, the body panels were merely decorative and they were made out of a bunch of different types of plastics altogether called Enduraflex. Probably because they were enduring and flexible. But who knows? The chassis itself was made of 273 individual pieces. And to compensate for the accumulated variances inherent in the manufacturing process of something that complex, the whole thing was assembled first. And then 39 mounting pads were mounted, drilled, and milled simultaneously by an automated rig that held them in exactly the right spot. Called mill and drill, it allowed the mounting points for the body panels to be located with an accuracy of two thousandths of an inch, regardless in variations in shape of the space frame. That meant the body panels would fit perfectly every time. Because they were plastic, they couldn't dent or rust. But should you have damaged part of your car, you could march right down to your Pontiac dealer and buy a new pre-painted part and bolt it right on. Or you could just bolt an entirely different car on there. Chubba Chetta, one of my personal heroes, who later went on to become the editor-in-chief of Car and Driver, showed the clarity of his crystal ball by writing in 1983, before the P car even went into production, that surely we were about to start seeing a bunch of fake Ferraris. He was right. The removable panels and mid-engine layout made the P car ripe for supercar knockoff body kits, including one called the Mera that was sold directly by Pontiac dealerships until Ferrari sued GM over it. No, no, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. That Mira was our car, and we had every right to use it. It was a complete coincidence that it looked exactly like that the Italian car. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyway, it was the inexpensiveness of those plastic body panels that finally got the P-Car approved for production. To illustrate, the cost to make a die for a metal fender was between five and seven million dollars. To make one for a plastic fender, just 50,000. So the 50 mile per gallon car's factory would be cheap to build too. And since this entire approval process took so long, the fuel crisis was now coming to an end. Therefore, out went the 1.8 liter and in went the Iron Duke. That was the two and a half liter four cylinder that was ironically in the original mock-up to begin with. Now, all we needed was a name. You know this car is the Fiero, but no, Fiero does not mean fire in Italian. It means proud. It would have been ironic if it meant fire because the Fiero had a huge fire problem. So it is actually ironic that the second place name that almost graced the P-Car was Fiamma, which hilariously means flame in Italian. The fire problems are even more ironic since my hero, the crystal ball reading soothsayer from Car and Driver, doomed the Fiero from the start by putting in writing that it's also the first GM car that we've seen this decade that seems to have all the bugs worked out on introduction day. <coughs> I think his crystal ball was a little bit smoked up. Woo. <coughs> Reportedly one in five first year Fieros experienced an engine fire. And ultimately every single Fiero ever made was recalled because the fire risk continued. The reasons for this were varied and numerous, including, for example, GM reducing the oil sump capacity of the four cylinder from four quarts to three for additional ground clearance. Unfortunately, what this meant was that when the Iron Duke invariably used a little bit of oil, there wouldn't be enough left in the sump, so it would starve for oil and send a flaming connecting rod right through the side of the block. This was made far more likely by a manufacturing defect in those connecting rods. 
And if that didn't happen, the engine would just leak a little bit of oil, which would land on the exhaust manifold and light the car on fire. Or there was another piece of wire that was really close to the exhaust manifold, and that would melt and light the car on fire too. When Pontiac said, we built excitement, they meant it. Because I can think of very few things more exciting than your car incinerating itself 12 ways from Sunday. Ultimately though, the 50 mile per gallon two seat commuter car happened. If you spec'd it just right, the 1984 fuel economy leader package and its ridiculously long gearing earned the Fiero an EPA rating of 31 miles per gallon city, 50 miles per gallon highway. But car and driver managed 20 miles per gallon with their test car, which admittedly wasn't a fuel economy special, but still needed 11.3 seconds to trudge its way to 60 miles an hour. Meaning the Fiero wasn't just the least efficient car among its peers, it was also the slowest. So much for 50 miles per gallon. Look, that was a smokescreen from the get-go. Pontiac needed cafe credits, but it took one look at the Fiero and couldn't ignore its sports car looks. All of the official communication revolved around it being an efficient commuter car. But does that look like a Prius to you? No, it looks like a Ferrari. This was a huge problem for enthusiasts because it had an economy car powertrain. Look, the Iron Duke felt more like an iron diesel. It could barely rev past 4,500 RPM, made a lot of torque, but only 92 horsepower. And then it was connected to a four-speed manual. The whole powertrain just didn't deliver on the sporty promise of the Fiero's looks. It was underpowered, overweight, numb, and flexy. They said this, not me. But a year later, the economy car got the V6 that the engineers had planned all along. 2.8 liters and 140 horsepower, combined with even better looks and a substantial reduction in aerodynamic drag, something that obviously should have been a priority in the first place given the fuel economy goals. It was now a monster, damn near as quick as the Ferrari 308 it could be made to look like. But the complaints continued. This review's headline was, looks aren't everything. The early car's lack of power had been addressed, but the V6 still came with a four speed and still had unacceptably heavy steering and ponderous handling, leading them to come to the verdict that all of that extra power just got you to the handling problem sooner. Yikes. Come on, guys, it wasn't that bad. The Fiero wasn't actually bad at all. In fact, it was a sweetheart. Part of the problem was that its looks and mid-engine layout created very lofty performance expectations. And the whole situation was made way worse because Pontiac's engineers kept making promises to the journalists about all the amazing stuff that was still to come. This happened year after year, prompting these guys to call it a sports car on an installment plan. Ouch. Ow. A couple of years later, the V6 finally got a five-speed. And for 1988, Rather unbelievably, the Fiero got an entirely new suspension. And I'm not talking about tuning. I mean an entirely new design that cost GM $30 million to engineer. The verdict was, Pontiac and America finally have a budget price sports car to be proud of. But before that punny line made it to the newsstand, the Fiero was canceled. There are plenty of conspiracy theories about how the Corvette crew didn't like how close the Fiero was about to get to GM's other plastic fantastic. After all, the second gen Fiero was to have quad four and turbocharged V6 firepower with a bigger body and more aggressive looks. But the real reason for its cancellation was, as it always is, economic. The 1988 revisions finally garnered the Fiero universal praise but that universal praise didn't translate into additional sales. Pontiac needed to sell 50,000 Fieros a year to be profitable, and in 88, sold only half that many. Combine that with both a shrinking market and additional competition from things like the CRX and the Toyota MR2, and General Motors forecasted accumulated losses of 20 to $30 million for the second generation Fiero. So there was no second generation Fiero. The Fiero's revolutionary production method went on to power Saturn's dent-proof success story, and it remained GM's only mid-engine car until the C8 Corvette. 
It started out as a mid-engined ray of MPG hope in the doldrums of the Malays era, and slowly evolved into the sports car that its engineers always intended it to be. Just as they were lying through their teeth about it being an efficient commuter car. No one in their right mind would look at this gorgeous little thing and think, wow, that must be a fuel economy special. Then again, no one was in their right mind after almost 10 years of malaise. Fiero might mean proud in Italian, but in the language of Pontiac, it meant hope. And I hope it doesn't catch on fire when I drive it. Oh, hi, I didn't see you standing there. But since you're there, let me ask you a question. Do you know about Ask Haggerty? That's a service that we offer to Haggerty Drivers Club members where you can call in and ask anything. That's also the only way. Hold on, there's a caller right now. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. This is Jason, how can I help you? The red line on that engine is 7,200 RPM. You're welcome. As I was saying, the Haggerty Drivers Club is the only way that you can get our award-winning drivers club. Hold on one second. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. This is Jason. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, a very strange tire size indeed. 205 55 15. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Mom. Uh, see you for dinner? Mm -hmm. Okay, love you. Bye. Anyway, as I was saying, that's how you get the magazine. Hold on one second. And there's a li Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. This is Jason. How can I help you? Ew. No, not ask anything. It's the only way for you to, to, to get the magazine and stuff. So there's, oh my God, there's a link that's above here somewhere floating on the thing you can click on and I get credit for it. It's probably in the description too. Hold on. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. Please hold. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. Please hold. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. Please hold. Hello and thank you for calling Haggerty and Ask Haggerty and Haggerty Drivers Club. If you know your party's extension, please dial it after the tone. Para continuar en español, o primer ocho. Anyway, there's also other cool stuff for HDC membership, including free advertising in our, in our classified ads, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for holding, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm single. Mm -hmm. Call me on my personal line after, uh, um, yeah, filming right now, thanks, bye. Thank you for holding. Fired, you're fired.